Thank you. Well, as we say in New Zealand, Kia ora! Oh, come on, Chicago. Kia ora! Kia ora! Welcome. Turning headwinds into tailwinds. Well, I've been to a few places where there are headwinds. Headwinds in life. Things like um, standing on the roof of the world. In fact, if, actually, if you want to go there, you do need a lot more than luck. And that's what I'd like to tell you about today. But actually, let's step back a bit, actually. Let's step back a bit from... Uh, 2006 and, and go way back. You know, I've been climbing my whole life and people go, why did you become a climber? I said, well, it's easy, you know, I sucked at rugby, you know, <laughs> nothing else to do in New Zealand. <laughs> By the time I was 18, that was my office, search and rescue mountaineer at Mount Cook National Park. But, well, I had a bit of a hiccup in my climbing career. In November of 1982, got stuck on the summit of our highest peak, Araki, Mount Cook, and had to sit in an ice cave in a freak storm that lasted 13 and a half days. 13 and a half days in a little ice cave. We got out of it, actually, at the end of November, trucked away to hospital, and thought we'd, well, thought we'd lose a few toes. But in actual fact, we were going to lose a lot more. I believe in life, um, we, have, we have gold standards. We have gold standards of great things. You know, I've seen the birth of my three children. I've been married to Anne for 30 years. I've stood on the roof of the world. But we have gold standards and some of the crappier bits of life, actually. For me, my gold standard of a dark day, my gold standard of pain, my gold standard of so many of those things was at 9 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Eve, 1982. Those were my legs just before I got wheeled into theatre to have both cut off below the knee. Well, you wake up from that. In fact, you wake up on Christmas Day, 1982. And from then on, I knew I had a real challenge in front of me to find that X. And that challenge, it wasn't to learn to walk or to ski or to climb even. That challenge I knew from then was to learn how to think again. And that's what this TEDx Chicago is. It's about how to learn to think again. For me, I've had to learn to think that every situation you look at, where's the opportunity? Not where's the adversity. Don't tell me where all the hard things are. I found those, actually by mistake. Show me where the advantage is, not the disadvantage. You know, so many people would look at a double amputee mountaineer and look at that and go, you know, cool, double amputee mountaineer. You know what I see? I see a mountaineer that's never going to get frostbitten feet again. Hey? <laughs> Got that one sussed. <laughs> My dream from when I was 11 years old was to, like any young Kiwi's dream, is to follow in the footsteps of our famous climbers, to stand on the, on the roof of the world. I thought I'd lost that dream, but I came to learn quite quickly. I knew I could get it back. And the one thing that defines, that turns a dream into a goal is actually to take the first step. Actually, here are some steps. Watch these. The climbers have spent a week preparing and are ready to roll. But for one, the challenge is unique. Mark Ingalls has a handicap that would stop most people from climbing a flight of stairs. Nevertheless, he intends to be the first man to summit Everest without legs. He's losing his voice in the thin air, but his new carbon fiber legs are working well. I'll whip them off, dry the stumps off. Huge advantage to be able to do this partway through the day. Huge advantage. It's working pretty damn well. They sure do. Gee, you know. It's, and that's actually why I wear these pants around all the time. Because if my legs aren't fitting right, I just stop, take my legs off, and fix them. I'm not sure what it's like here in Chicago, but in New Zealand, if I strolled down the street, dropped my strides, took my legs off, probably get arrested. <laughs> no, not here? Cool. Well, whatever. That is a big headwind in so many different ways. One, it actually sticks right up in the, in the jet stream. 
You know, that turns Everest from being a five-day climb into being a 60-day climb. You know, and that's the real challenge, really. But it is my world. I've been climbing since I've been 11. You know, these legs, they, they op operate all right um, walking along here. They really suck at going downhill. But, gee, they're fantastic when you turn around and you go up. And that, for me, is where I belong. But not everyone else belongs up there. The one thing you need to understand about mountaineering is it's about focus, because it's a big job. You've got to stay focused. But it's also a team environment, so you need that resilience and that synergy. You know, that was my team on Everest. There's um, Woody, Fetu, Cowboy. They're your team not to give you a hand up. If you need to get a hand up Everest, you shouldn't be there. They're a team to look you in the eye and go, mate, and tell you the truth. Actually, to do that, you need to learn a lesson. And it was a hard lesson for me to learn. And I believed actually to be a really functional person in a team. You have to have the skill to stand outside of yourself, look back in, and see the person that other people see. Not just physically, but emotionally and intellectually. If you can't do that, then you can't understand people's compliments and their criticisms of you. It took me a lot of years. Actually, I learned it when I was winemaking, when we had to do a major culture change in our company. And it was far more powerful for me in my personal life in making sure I keep the foot on the gas than it ever was in my corporate life. You know, gee, I get up every morning, look in the mirror, as you probably do, you know? It's, um, I was wearing my good legs that morning. It's like, sweet. But my wife's normally looking across and she's going, you think you look like that? Actually, you look more like that. But <laughs> it's like, whatever. Well, and you need to know that stuff if you're going to go up there. You know, above 8,000 metres, they call it the death zone. This is the last day on Everest. It's a tough day. You'll go past dead bodies. You'll really be challenging, challenging yourself. It's right at the limit of human physical um, capability. But if you stand on top of that second step, right in the middle, if you can stand on top of that, then Everest is yours if you can answer two questions. The first question is, are you tough enough to take the next step? The second question is, should you? And that's why you have a team. I was privileged to stand on that and take a few more steps. 90 minutes ahead, Mark Ingalls conquers the last difficult traverse before the summit. This is the last uh, about 50 metres on the roof of the world. You take about five steps and you stop and you try and suck some O's and take another five steps. After climbing on prosthetic legs for 47 days, Mark Ingalls has made the summit of Everest. He's now the first man without legs to reach the top of the world. And what a place it is. You know, the first thing that people say, what's the view like from the top? So, well, ah, it's so hard, you get there, you look up, and you see these beautiful big 8,000 metre peaks around you. You look further away, and there's the, the curve of the earth. And then this big wave hits you. It's a wave of relief. You've made it! No more steps. But then straight after it, there's a bigger wave. And it's a wave of abject fear, because you've realised that you're halfway. More people die going down Everest than they ever do going up. I knew I had to get off that mountain quick, and it was a long trip home. But every step of that way home, I had one vision in my mind's eye, and that's my team. That's Lucy Ann, Amanda, and Jerry. They're my reason not just to survive, but to excel. I hope you've got a team like that behind you as well. Actually, it wasn't all um, pretty on summit day. It was minus 50 on our summit day. And I need to use my hands a lot when I'm climbing. And I thought I could manage it pretty well, but I didn't manage it all that well. Ended up with a bit of frostbite on the end of the fingers. Slow learner, I know, you know. But I do learn. 
But it's nothing, you know, these are what they are like now. Old Stumpy there is not much use for anything. No more picking the nose with the little finger. Um, and these two, ah, that's nothing. You know, it's like you nibbled your fingernails back a bit. Ladies, 50% discount if you have your nails done, hey? <laughs> the only one thing is you can't participate in road rage anymore. <laughs> but that's all right. It's like, gee. You are the change makers. You have the opportunity to be in the future, um, and many of you have been already. We've heard of some of them today. I just have a slightly different opportunity. Have a look at this. Before yeah. leaving base camp, Mark has some unfinished business. Very nice to see you. See you again. On a previous training climb in the Himalayas, Mark met Tile. Tile and I are about the same age. Uh, we lost our legs in the same way. We both lost them through, through frostbite uh, 20 odd years ago. But the difference is, is that he's been walking around on his knees for 20 years. As his old friend smiles in disbelief, <laughs> Mark fits him up with a second chance. This is uh, one strong man. If anyone can do it, yeah, I think it's uh, Tile here can do it. I say that because to have a socket made, you make a plaster cast of the, uh, of the stump, you make a, a mold, you make a close fitting socket. I only had basic measurements. His muscles had atrophied over 20 years. It's coming around pretty quick, huh? Yeah, he's going very well. This is two hours after he first stood up. Stand up straight. Yep, that's it. <laughs> that's great. Whoa, ho! And look at the smile on his face. It's worth a million bucks. Only to a dentist. Uh, this is the best high altitude physical therapy I've ever seen. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, Dilly. <laughs> Oh, he's happy. Oh, very happy. It's good to see someone up front. He hasn't walked for 20 years. It must be like, you know, a miracle for him. Oh, it's been probably one of the best days of my life, really. I've always professed that one of the most important things you can do in life is to do some good for someone else. And today it's um, sort of tangible, really. So it's pretty neat, yeah. It was more than pretty, pretty neat. You know, See Tile stand up after 20 years. Oh, that was more important than standing on the summit of Everest for me. To understand that I'm not disabled. I'm a double amputee. You know, in our first world countries, we shouldn't have disability. Disability is about a lack of access to resources or bad thinking. Well, Tile had fantastic thinking, but he did have a lack of ability to get resources. My promise to him when I first met him in 2004 was that he would have what I have. And what I have isn't disability, but it's the opportunity to live life in a different way. That's what we all have. Just some of us, it's a bit tougher than for others. But it's the one thing that you have to, actually have to go out and grab. It's the most important thing. You know, life's pretty tough at times. You know, I've felt like that rabbit on many an occasion, you know. You never quite know what the U-bend in life is sending down towards you. But, wow. Well, so often we give people the tools, we give them the skills, we give them the education. But the most powerful thing you can give someone is actually the attitude to use it. That rabbit's going to kick butt, you know? <laughs> now, I wasn't particularly good at English at school, but there was one thing that I took away from it. And it was a quote from T.S. Eliot. And it's what so much of what TED is about, what the University of Chicago is about, what you're about, and it's how I try and live my life. It's only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far they can go. We've heard of, um, of so many speakers speak of, about that today, exactly that. I don't know how far I'm going to be able to go. I haven't tested those limits yet, and I'm still trying. But as long as you can live like that, then the world will be your oyster.
exactly able as a really fit, able kind of I'm not the equal of them, but I'm the equal of the mountain. And my challenge to every one of you in this room is don't be the equal of your next mountain. Be more than the equal of your next mountain. Thank you. Cheers.